Hello everyone. So in the last video, we spoke about some basics of coded track circuits, such as how codes are transmitted, different types of track circuits, the physics behind it. But in this one, we will go deeper in trying to understand the directionality of track circuits, the, how impedance bonds work, the prevention of overreach and vacant versus occupied codes. So we'll get into that. And this is Rail Academy for you. Now looking at the track circuit, very basic diagram here, there's a transmitter, there's signal that goes into the receiver and then comes back to the transmitter. The signal can be either in the form of an alternating current or it could be in the form of a pulsating DC current. Both of those cause emission of EM waves from the rail and cause the rail to act like an antenna. Again, the logic of that is covered in the previous video. Now the direction of the train is very important here. And the train has to always be traveling from receiver to transmitter. So in this case, the train is traveling in this direction. Transmitter is transmitting the signal. It goes below the pickup coil, where pickup coil receives the signal. Then it goes into the axle, comes back from the axle back to the transmitter. So everything is good right now. The train moves further and now you have the second axle inside, but still the signal is able to reach the pickup antenna, goes into the axle and comes back. So again, everything is fine right now. But if the train were to be going in the opposite direction, that is, it is going from transmitter to receiver, then in that case, the signal goes from transmitter, goes into the axle, but it is not able to reach the pickup antenna. Now you might be wondering, well, that's simple. You can just place the pickup antenna before. That's not true because now eventually when the train travels, you'll have second axle under the train step inside. And once the second axle enters the boundary, the signal will again be shorted by the second signal and it will not be able to reach the pickup coil. So in short, track circuits are directional and the direction of the train traveling is very important. It has to always be from receiver to transmitter. Now you must be thinking, does that mean track circuits are unidirectional, that the trains can only run in one direction? No, the good news is that the transmitter and receiver are switchable and they are switchable based on the route set. So if a train is traveling in this direction, if the route is set in this direction, then all of the track circuits along the way will have receiver and then transmitter. But if on the same track, the route is set in that direction, i.e. it's the route is, the train is going from here to here, then the same transmitter will now be switched to a receiver and same receiver will now be switched to a transmitter so that your train is still able to receive all the signals. So that explains the directionality. Another thing I mentioned in the last video is that the benefit of these coded track circuits over conventional track circuits is that conventional ones only do vacancy detection and broken rail detection, but the coded track circuits are also able to transmit code and transmit information to the train. But another benefit of these track circuits is that in conventional DC track circuits, we needed insulation joints, which again is covered in one of my DC track circuit videos. So they need insulation joints to separate one track circuit from another. But in coded track circuits, we are able to achieve that with something called an impedance bond. So in short, we don't need to now actually cut the track like we did before. So like the track is actually sliced here in the AC track circuits and AC track circuits with speed codes, we don't need to actually slice the track. It's a continuous track with impedance bonds. And what these impedance bonds are able to do is that they're able to suppress frequency of one track circuit. So if this is frequency A, it's able to suppress the frequency A in this direction, same way if this is frequency B, it's able to suppress frequency B in that direction. And that's how it is able to achieve electrical isolation between two track circuits without actually having to slice or physically cut the track. How does it do that? Well, that's what we'll look into now. Let's understand this step by step. Here's a typical double track layout. Let's place some impedance bond on the layout. Now these impedance bonds will actually be the areas of electrical separation between track circuits. Going forward, let's place some transmitters, some receivers, some tuning units in this arrangement. With this arrangement, transmitter is able to transmit the signal to the receiver. It's also able to transmit speed codes to the train. So this is just a typical layout. It's one of the ways of arranging transmitter, receiver, and tuning units, and now we'll understand understand exactly how impedance bonds and tuning units work. Let me also show you a real representation of that diagram. So if you're looking at this picture here, <clears throat> then you see that 
this is a real Z bond. This Z bond is represented by the Z in the diagram. You have tuning unit here. So there's one tuning unit here, one is there. You have actual leads coming out of the tuning unit to the track. So you have actual leads going from here to the track and you have one another cable coming out of the tuning unit into the transmitter or receiver. So this is how this diagram looks like in real life. Now, let me explain what impedance bonds are. So impedance bonds are nothing but RLC circuits that act like one of the band stop filters and band pass filters and all of that. The beauty of RLC circuits is that the impedance the RLC circuits are able to offer are frequency dependent. So if you look at resistor, resistor is pretty frequency independent that at all frequencies of current resistance is the same, but inductance, it changes by frequency. So at low frequency, it is almost zero impedance. At high frequency, it is high impedance. Capacitor is the opposite. At low frequency, it is high impedance, high frequency is low impedance. So what you are able to do is that you are able to arrange RLC circuits in such a way that they offer high impedance to specific frequencies. What that means is that this could be an RLC circuit and it could be designed in such a way that it offers high impedance to frequency one, which is the frequency of track circuit to the left. So the left frequency is then suppressed at this impedance bond. Same way frequency of track circuit to the right, which in this case is F3, is suppressed in this direction. So the, this signal is not able to reach the left side because this RLC circuit suppresses the frequency and also it offers no impedance to the traction return current. So the traction return current can flow freely. This is how impedance bonds work in essence. Another thing I want to speak about are tuning units, which is also very important. So in electrical engineering, one of the most important concepts is of impedance matching. So what impedance matching means is that in order to transmit maximum power, input impedance has to be equal to output impedance. So in the scenario of a track circuit, input impedance would be the impedance of track plus the ballast and plus the sleeper. So all of this should be equal to the output impedance, which is the impedance of your receiver. Only then maximum power will be transmitted. Actually, you can also draw your own electrical circuit and just have two resistance in it, R1 and R2. You can set different values of R1 and R2, uh, have same input voltage, and you'll see that the maximum power transmitted, I square R will be the highest when R1 is equal to R2. Another importance of impedance matching is that when input impedance is not equal to output impedance, then there are a lot of reflections. And these reflections are just a property of nature, or you can say property of physics. Same thing happens with optical waves. If the optical waves are traveling from air to water, which is two mediums with different densities, some wave will be transmitted and some wave will be reflected. Same thing happens with electrical signals as well, that when impedances are different, some current is transmitted and some is reflected back. And we don't want those reflections in our system. So that's one of the reasons why tuning units are needed because we use these tuning units to match the input impedance to the output impedance. That actually brings us to a drawback. And that drawback is that in case there is rain or snow or leaves on the track, that can actually change the input impedance. And in some cases, the input, the input impedance can change by so much that retuning is needed. That means a lot of extra maintenance is required around tuning units. But in short, that is the purpose of tuning units. These are some real block diagrams of real track circuits. I'll put the source of these block diagrams in the description below. You can pause here and try to look at these block diagrams and try to understand these, but we'll not go into that in this video. Another important thing I wanted to mention is that that Z bond arrangement that you saw or on this picture here is only one way of doing that. In reality, there's many different ways you can do that. Some Vendors also call it S-bond, you can call it 8-bond LC circuit. There's different ways of achieving the same thing that the electrical separation using RLC circuits can be done in different ways. So in short, that is how impedance bonds and tuning units work. Lastly, what I want to speak about are some peculiarities around vacancy and occupancy. So this is a typical arrangement in that you have transmitter, which is transmitting a vacancy code at F1 frequency that is then received by the receiver. On the adjacent track circuit, you have a different frequency 
so that you can achieve the separation between those two f1 f3 uh, here transmitter is transmitting the vacancy code at f3 frequency now instead of f1 you could have even more frequencies you can have f1 f3 f5 f7 but eventually down the line you will have f1 repeat again there's only so many frequencies you can use so at some point f1 will repeat again so now f1 repeats again transmitter is transmitting at f1 frequency to receiver now there's always a chance that f1 despite using tuning units despite using impedance bonds the f1 unit can overreach and reach the receiver of this track circuit but how track circuits are able to mitigate that these coded track circuits are that there is something called a vacancy code meaning that even when track circuits are vacant these transmitters are transmitting some code to the receiver and this code on f1 frequency is different from this code on the f1 frequency so if you remember this diagram from my video before the code transmitted is always compared with the code received by the receiver and only then track circuits are able to declare the circuit vacant or not vacant which means that in the rare scenario if f1 frequency if this code were to reach all the way to this receiver the comparison will fail because the actual vacancy code here is different from the vacancy code here another thing i want to mention is that as soon as train steps onto this track circuit the actual speed code is now transmitted which means when the train is not there you have a vacancy code so you're still transmitting a code but it's a vacancy code but as soon as the train steps onto the track circuit that's when the speed code is transmitted and that's when the train knows all of the information the speed it has to travel on the movement of authority and all of the things i hope this has been helpful and i hope this has been able to explain some more specificities of coded track circuits thank you everyone i'll see you in the next one